This is a story of humans trying to create gods in their own image. The world is coming to an end at the expense of humans as death fills the air for what is left is going to the brink of destruction or should I say transformation. British scientist Dr. Simon Redding made a last phone call to his friend Tommy who was also a scientist like himself who was keeping refuge in an underground bunker in America. He related how the whole problem started in the first place which was the consummation of human satiation of God worship which was now resulted in an apocalyptic resolution. In fact the human species religiosity it is limitlessly boundless in the hopefulness of expecting a fantastic creature to save the world. In such a delusional ego the golden calf reference came into play. You see Moses went up to the mountain to speak to Yahweh for God knows how long and his followers, the impatient Hebrew Israelites to be fair, had been waiting for him for a message from Yahweh, demanded a golden calf to lead them, which Aaron, his brother, who had no idea when his brother was returning, was forced to build a golden calf that will evaporate all their problems to the stratosphere. Well, that didn't happen, for when Moses returned, they were met with his wrath, or should I say Yahweh's wrath, and if you sincerely look around you in society, we tend to gravitate towards the worship of celebrity, religious and political heroes whom we believe can take our problems away. From the doctor's perspective, humans always have this need in their cerebral cortex to fashion a god that will come to earth to make things better, an expectant utopia which sounds good and harmless but led to the creation of superhumans. Well, during the space race, or should I say rage, which started between the late 50s and 70s, the egotistical Americans and the arrogant Soviet Union were at each other's neck over who was the first to get to the moon and become the king of space. A lot of spying was going on at that time. The elusive British, whom all had underestimated due to the fact that they were dropped from the dominant position by America, were busy spying on everyone. Such was the Nazi German scientists who were doing scientific experimentation and working for the egotistical Americans. And this was after the Second World War and they were made citizens. One of such was Gwena Magnus Maximilian von Brown, a close friend of Walt Disney, an aerospace engineer and a space architect who designed the schematics for rocket technology for space exploration. Using the scientists' schematics, the elusive British built a space station with no one knowing the wiser. Now, before Adolf Hitler ever thought or dreamed of the creation of a superhuman race, the elusive British were already on a more significant project of creating a superhuman race and this cannot be further from the truth for there was an imaginative writer of those days called H. G. Wells, who was a very close friend of the British Prime Minister, the late Winston Churchill. He was a futurist and was the first to write a superhuman novel called The Invisible Man in 1897. In the shadows of the government, he was rumored to be part of this secret project to build a superhuman race. While the arrogant Soviet Union and the egotistical Americans were at each other's throats for space dominance, the elusive British had already built a rocket prepared to go to space, which was under the project called Lufnasa. The name was taken after the Gaelic holiday festival, which was a commemoration of the god Luf. Towards his mother, Teltu, who harvested the earth till she died of shame, humiliation, suffering, exhaustion, and unspecified natural causes. Another story in the Irish folklore was that two gods fought over the grain of the earth. One of the gods was Crum Dub, who selfishly fought for the grain for himself, while the other god, Luf, fought for the grain of the earth for humanity's sake. 
Anyway, when the elusive British went secretly to space, they were not too arrogant or egotistical to become over intelligent on what they least understood, for they were humble enough to understand that outer space was alien to them. So they sent three volunteers, two males and a female, as a sacrificial lamb to whatever they come in contact with out there in space. And this is not the first time the elusive British government had sacrificed some of their own in the name of what they pursued. An example was the sacrifice of patriotic soldiers at Operation Grapple in 1956, for the elusive British were not interested in going to the moon. They were more interested in what they would come in contact with through the collision of their spacecraft. So for seven days, they were in space with no shielding effect to protect the pilots, for this was done deliberately. And in the third week, the spaceship crashed and landed on a nearby shore. Their results exceeded expectations and it was a well-kept secret from the whole world. What came with the spacecraft was something far beyond radiation, which was in the form of a living organism. This fungal-like entity dispersed mushroom spores and without wasting any time, they took it to the underground bunker of the wind-scale nuclear power station. The first successful creation of the first superhuman was done through the process of mycology. As the fungal-like organism merged with the three humans it came back with from space, it was called Morrigan Lugos. The name Morrigan was taken from the goddess of war and fate of an Irish folklore. She was also a bringer of death and the name Lugos is from a three-headed deity from the Celtics who was the god of trade, justice, war, craftsmanship and harvest. Morrigan Lugos never had any personal verbal interaction with the elusive British scientist. Morrigan Lugos communicated in various sounds and emitted radio signals to the scientist's understanding and on special occasions Morrigan Lugos ejects digital coded spots. Morrigan Lugos did terrific things beyond the scientist's expectations to the points they began to worship Morrigan Lugos. Now one thing had to be known is that anyone who stood in the presence of Morrigan Lugos starts to feel sexually lustful and this is because Morrigan Lugos has a sexual infectious aura which forced its worshippers, the scientists, to self-stimulate uncontrollably. It was that bad that one of them yanked his manhood off due to self-stimulation. Some of the scientists who had excessive sexual indulgence were found with their manhood stuck to the mushroom part of Morrigan Lugos, which resulted in extra security personnel being placed to avoid a wank fest. The elusive British never used Morrigan Lugos as a weapon, for from the doctor's perspective, Morrigan Lugos was just a laid-back entity with super intelligence. At this time, in addition to Russia and America, other powerful countries were also involved in the superhuman race project. The least expected to be involved was the underestimated Indians, the third most polluted country in the world. Nobody saw it coming. They were 20 years ahead of everyone except the elusive British. They created their own superhuman, which was built like a god and had the ability to control both matter and energy. It was infused with artificial intelligence programmed to save India from pollution. It was Greta Thunberg on steroids. They called him Krishna and those who created Krishna never lived to see its progress. In the Hindu religion, the name Krishna is a significant deity often regarded as one of the principal avatars of God Vishnu. He is worshipped as the eighth avatar of Vishnu and also the supreme god in his own right. Krishna is depicted in various roles throughout Hindu texts. He is celebrated as a divine cowhead, a mischievous child, a wise counselor, a compassionate friend, and a valiant warrior. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna serves as the charioteer and spiritual guide to Prince Arjuna, imparting profound teachings on duty, righteousness, and the nature of self. He is also associated with love, compassion, joy, and divine playfulness. According to the partial schematics the elusive British stole, they concluded
concluded that Krishna was a cloned body designed with bacteria and infused with artificial intelligence that perceives its environment and takes actions that are necessary, which maximize its chances of success. Krishna could grow secretaries from within and connect to the world, making it easier for Krishna to study the world. When Krishna was activated, it was with a peaceful orientation. But truth be told, perspectives differed. It was said that when Krishna spoke, people cried. It was like listening to an eternal being from an extraterrestrial planet. Or should I just be sarcastic and say his voice was like an angel? As part God and part artificial intelligence, Krishna did what was necessary to save India from itself by eliminating and wiping out 90% of the population, cleaning the air and destroying old infrastructures. With Krishna, this had nothing to do with empathy, but what was necessary and what it was built and programmed to do. Now, the paranoid Pakistan who had been at loggerheads with India over Kashmir since the 60s felt threatened and they made the mistake of striking at India with their nuclear armament. Before they could say Jack Robinson, Krishna reversed the strike and Pakistan was raised to the ground before they could blink. Not one citizen was left breathing. The effect of the nuclear explosion in Pakistan spread far and wide causing a nuclear winter which lasted for three winters. This didn't bother Krishna for Krishna was only programmed to re-engineer India and Krishna was doing this according to its own understanding despite its devastating effect on the world. The hesitant Iranians needed to catch up in creating a superhuman. They created theirs based on religious scriptures for their ambition was to create an angel who had a connection with the most high Allah and bent to his will. It was named Malak al Maut, which has the ability to generate a force field that dissolves atomic bonds of nearby matter. Its name was based on the angel of death known as Azrael. The esoteric Ethiopians too had their own superhuman called Ras. The name was taken from the word Rastafari and the body was attached with the preserved rotten head of the late Hel Selassie. It was more like a cyborg from the future for its end skeleton was not different from that of the Terminator series 800. The busiest country when it came to creating superhumans was the egotistical Americans. The elusive British who were spying on them knew all about how they made their superhuman Jerry Craven, a cyborg-like entity created from the broken body of a war veteran who was an Air Force pilot. And the weirdest bit about Jerry Craven is that he believes he is in the afterlife and to be frank, he has a mentality of a devoted religious caveman. But I wouldn't expect anything less, for his name Craven means a Christ-like figure or image. Even though they tried to keep it secret, the elusive British knew that the egotistical Americans were incapable of keeping secrets and were useless at the spy game. As Dr. Simon Redding was about to touch on the topic of the superhuman the humble Chinese created, he was disturbed by some end-time apocalyptic scroungers who were trying to steal and take the last bits of things left from him. But the doctor came prepared as he pulled out an Uzi gun and sprayed the air with bullets and the Marudas took to their heels. You see, the elusive British were onto everyone, especially the humble Chinese. In a scientific mega reactor called Buddha's Spine, they created something far more spectacular called Maitreya. In all schools of Buddhism, Maitreya is referred to as a Bodhisattva who is regarded as the future Buddha of this world, which means a person who is on the path of awakening. Not only that, according to Buddhist works of literature like Amitabha Sutra and Lotus Sutra, Maitreya is also referred to as Ajita, the invincible and the unconquerable one. When Maitreya was created, he was subjected to super tiny cameras called scanning tunneling microscopes, which were attached to his brain's visual processing center and 
the cortex. This was to help the humble Chinese scientists to see extremely small things directly with their brain. But that didn't go too well for them. Not only that, but they also made Maitreya focus intensely on the tiny parts that make up body like atoms. For every creation and destruction living within the body of Maitreya defies the rules of quantum physics. When Maitreya reached a state of being beyond his infinite abilities, he was marked by a strange light. This light comes when Maitreya is tapping into energy in the empty spaces between tiny particles even when they are not there. Maitreya was built as a weapon and the humble Chinese government used political prisoners as practical guinea pigs for Maitreya's powers. But the opposite happened. For in truth, no one knows what Maitreya was thinking and when they tried, it had devastating effects. He turned the security guards into a vast musical instrument that made incredible beautiful sounds captivating everyone who heard it and released the political prisoners. He also arranged all the government officials and scientists into a warm shaped structure that could support itself. Then Matraya launched them into space using the musical instruments made out of the security guards and activated them like a living probe by making them share information about the solar system through a special connection between their brains. Eventually, the structure broke apart and crashed into Jupiter. Now, back to India's savior Krishna, the Greta Thunberg on steroids. Krishna successfully filtered the air of any radiation from Pakistan's waste without malice. Krishna had turned Pakistan into an atomic bug, literally a wasteland. You see, the problem was that Krishna's action impacted neighboring countries and Krishna, in his defense, consciously or unconsciously, didn't do anything about this problem. So, enmity grew from these countries towards India, which meant war. Malak al Maut, who was built and created by the hesitant Iranians to be bent towards the will of the most magnificent, the highest, and the most benevolent Allah, did not bend. In fact, he moved the hearts of the citizens of Iranians away from religion and into the hands of despair and suicide. Malak al Maut was a toxic entity that destroyed everything in its path. Not on purpose, but that was the way he was built. And his name, Malak, wasn't encouraging for his name was taken from the angel of death. Initially, Malak al Maut didn't care about the outside world, for he was content in being hidden underground in the Tehran secret lab. However, due to his toxicity and still learning about himself, Malak mistakenly wiped out Tehran with his generative force field. Then he left Tehran, which was no longer there. One thing was that Malak al Maut noticed a change in the atmosphere, and everyone knew that Malak al Maut was walking towards Pakistan, maybe to challenge Krishna. Now, when it comes to the egotistical American government, the origin of Jerry Craven was a theatrical scam on the surface due to the fact that the egotistical American government wanted to bypass the Senate and Congress in creating a superhuman. So to avoid any future repercussion legally, they created a dangerous scenario, found the candidate in Jerry Craven for the purpose of turning him superhuman, but then made him have a flight accident on purpose and then lied to their citizens that as an astronaut, Jerry Craven crashed in an experimental space shuttle. The elusive British were aware of this plot and impressed by their ability to scientifically make things smaller using miniature technologies and stem cells to create a simple artificial nervous system to rebuild Jerry Craven into a living cybernetic super cyborg. When Jerry Craven came to consciousness, his mental state wasn't right for he was traumatized due to the accident and he began to act weird. As I said before, his mental state of mind is that of a devout Christian caveman, believing that he was meant to be in heaven or he was in heaven, for he did everything good in his lifetime and wonder why he was back. Only if he knew the scam. Quite and not understanding his state of mind, the egotistical American took him to a remote area, built a place for him looking like American heaven, and for some self-deluded, self-righteous indignation, Jerry Craven believed that American had made contact with heaven 
heaven. And so without helping him get his mind right by a psychologist, they took advantage of his gullibility and play along with his fantasy. And as a weapon, he goes on espionage and very dangerous missions for them. Jerry Craven was not the type to ask questions and he obeyed and did as he was told. Such a dangerous mission was the one in Grenada for the egotistical Americans got a hit signal from Novaya Goraj in Cuba, an old Russian cybernetic superhuman cosmonaut who had passed its time for it was built 10 years before Jerry Craven. The elusive British were aware of this mission and the lies the egotistical American government told its citizens that revolutionized Cubans were building an airstrip where the arrogant Russians would land their planes, which the egotistical Americans see as a threat. When Jerry Craven and Novaya Gorat came in contact, it was the battle of the fittest. According to the elusive British who were spying from space above, that it was a good thing that the fight didn't commence in public space, for the vibration of each hit at each other could bust eardrums and render an onlooker blind. Novaya Gorach lost the battle to Jerry Craven. Not because Novaya Gorach was weak, but because Novaya was an old, built, obsolete superhuman who had passed its time and little or nothing is known of Novaya Gorach. Not even the elusive British had any cogent information on Novaya. Secretly, the egotistical Americans were going to send Jerry Craven to eliminate Krishna. And with all sincerity, from the perspective of the egotistical Americans, Krishna was a threat not only to its neighboring countries but also to the world because of the damage Krishna was causing to save India from its pollution. But one thing Jerry Craven should put in mind is that Krishna is a new age superhuman. Like Novaya, he has to be honest with himself that he might have passed his expiring date for he might be no match for Krishna. At this time, the world was on the brink of destruction or a symbiotic transformation. Big Ben came crashing down with an explosion and Dr. Simon Redding continued to relate what brought the world to this point. There was a superhuman known as Dajjal who was unknown to most people, even the egotistical Americans. The funniest part of the Jaws creation was that he was built under the noses of the egotistical Americans. But before we discuss the Jaws origin further, we need to shift our focus to Morrigan Lugos. As a strict protocol, under the underground bunker, the elusive British scientist involved with Morrigan Lugos, including Dr. Simon Redding, had to take antifungal medication due to Morrigan Lugos' sport because when some scientists spent six months in the presence of Morrigan Lugos, unknowingly they were inhaling and breathing in the mushroom spores that emit out of Morrigan Lugos. And when the scientists fell to their death and were sliced open, they found multiple living microprotein organisms with heads as big as a doll in their stomachs. As I have said before, Morrigan Lugos never interacted verbally with any of the scientists. It just communicated in sounds and radio frequency, which was understandably to the scientists. But on this fateful day, Dr. Simon Redding, who had taken enough antifungal medication and was drunk from drinking too much wine, decided to go downstairs on his own to visit Morrigan Lugos. Upon arriving at Morrigan Lugos's presence, the doctor, in his drunken stupor, arrogantly asked Morrigan Lugos a bold question. What was Morrigan Lugos's purpose? The reason behind this question was because Morrigan Lugos had never asked for anything in return, not even their worship. To the doctor's surprise, the three-headed superhuman answered him verbally, intermediately, that she represents a fundamental part of the human DNA that drives them to stay alive, and essentially a tiny part of the human primal brain combined with universal intelligence. That humans are driven by primal instincts and are fundamentally connected to their animal origins despite their intelligence and sophistication. With all their sophistication and advancements are essentially just animals wearing clothes. This was Morrigan Lucas putting the arrogant doctor in his place. Then she went further by telling him how selfish and self-centered humans are. Throughout human evolutionary history, humans have not been naturally inclined to work together and be kind to each other without some effort or getting something back in return for doing a good thing. To survive on earth, humans had no choice but to work together. So, evolution gave humans a way to feel good when they admired or feared something powerful like gods or sacred objects. This made the human 
human brain release happy chemicals encouraging each other to stop and worship these things. This collective worship strengthens the group because everyone feels good doing it together. Humans have a way of making themselves feel good when they do helpful things. It's like a reward for being nice. What bewilders Morrigan Lugos is humans fixation on something in the human brain that gets triggered which gives a pleasant feeling of assurance. Morrigan Lugos gets it for the human body gives the brain a nice chemical called morphine when doing this silly thing and since it's a collective feeling something mundane becomes very important. This mundane thing becomes something of worship that must be pleased and protected collectively. Humans create rules and moral codes to protect sacred objects. Over time this behavior leads to conflict. Even though this behavior seems successful and well intended, it's amazingly shocking how Adolf Hitler was put in power. In simple terms, humans are nothing but glorified monkeys in fancy clothes. All their social achievements are based on lies. Her creation are based on lies, which is valid for the three astronauts who went into space weren't told that they were sacrificial lambs to the slaughter. And when they came back, they became this entity known as Morrigan Lugos. In truth, Morrigan Lugos came into existence because of false beliefs about the need to explore space. She acknowledges that she is a product of collective lies resulting from the elusive British government's search for meaning and purpose, all due to the desire for dominance. Dr. Simon Redding, on his knees, was bewildered, flabbergasted, and astonished by Morrigan Lugos's explanation. And Morrigan Lugos never spoke verbally to him again. During the Iraq invasion, the egotistical Americans claimed that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, which was a blatant lie. It was confirmed that the Iraqi president had underground bunkers, but they were either stashed with valuables or empty, with no sign of any weapons of so-called mass destruction. A private military contractor from the United States took hold of these underground bunkers as labs and secretively, under the nose of the egotistical American government, without their knowledge, created a superhuman called Dajjal. The bewildered doctor, Simon Redding, wondered why they had chosen such a name. The name was taken from the Quran, which describes al masi at Dajjal as the Islamic Antichrist and is known as the deceitful Messiah. According to Islamic eschatology, al masi al-Dajjal is an evil figure who would pretend to be the promised Messiah and later claim to be Allah the most magnificent, appearing before the day of judgment from the east and also performing miracles like Anobi Isa, the one Christians call Jesus. The Jaw was built as a living superhuman artificial intelligence. He was a superhuman time lord who could perceive time uniquely, seeing multiple potential futures. In some of those futures, which are very few, the Jaw could observe conscious beings present in environments suitable for developing psychic abilities like remote viewing. The Jaw was no ordinary superhuman, for he was designed and created to endure the effects of time and handle its power and energy. Unlike any other being on earth, the Jal can see time flowing around him. But there was a problem with the Jal. He was incompletely built and was a rushed work of 18 months. The engineering work involving the Jal was done with little oversight and involved cutting edge or unusual techniques which produced a creature without sanity. In reality, he was Norman Bates with superpowers. He is a super psychopath, possibly unstable and dangerous, for he doesn't have the usual mental stability or rationality that most people do. And this doesn't mean he's insane. He's just without sanity. The Jao's understanding of the world is entirely different and his experience is way off the radar of an average person's experience. For he can see what no one can see. The Jao's ability permits him to perceive or understand different possible future paths that emerge based on people's choices. As he can see these emergement timelines with his visions wherever he directs his attention and sees branching timelines forming behind them. So, he sees one path forward and many possibilities arising from every decision or action. The Jal is aware of his thinking like a conscious being, but his decision making and reaction are very instinctive and automatic, similar to how insects act. He sees it as having the most precise route in his vision when moving towards a particular area or path. He strategically chooses a path that avoids potential futures where he dies or he is terminated. If the Jal were to die, it will lead to negative consequences or a dark future. 
However, the Jah's ability to see the future seems unaffected by his fate. His visions focus on events that seemed unrelated to what happens to him personally. The Jah finds futures where bad things happen more intriguing and fun, possibly because they seem easier to understand or predict than more complex outcomes. The Jah believes that being mentally sharp and strategic is more valuable than being mentally stable. He rejects the idea of belonging to any society or community and prefers to live independently and make decisions based on tactical thinking rather than societal norms. Basically, Dajjal doesn't give a flying saucer and at this moment, his focus is India. The reality is that all eyes were on the underestimated Indians due to Krishna's action and to be frank, no one knew what was happening in the country of India. The arrogant Russians displayed boundless resilience. Despite losing Novaya Goraj in the battle to Jerry Craven in Grenada, they resolved to create a new superhuman. They reconstructed Novaya Goraj using the same cosmonauts and bestowed upon him the name Perun. Perun is a Slavic god worshipped by the East Slavs in ancient Russia. He is associated with thunder, lightning, storms, and war. Perun is often depicted in Slavic mythology as a mighty deity wielding a thunderbolt or axe and riding a chariot pulled by goats or horses across the sky. Perun is considered the highest god in the Slavic pantheon. He is often associated with the sky and celestial forces. He is believed to control the weather and protect the people from evil forces and enemies. As the god of war, warriors also invoked Perun for strength and victory in battle. Influential figures within the corridors of Russian power funded Perun's construction, which cost the arrogant Russians a significant sum. Without delay, Perun was dispatched to India to confront Krishna, whose actions were believed to influence Russia's weather pattern. At this time, Krishna had nearly completed his task rejuvenating India. He had reduced the population by 90%, purified the air for the remaining few, demolished old structures to erect new ones, cleaned the streets and made them anew. He also ensured clean and drinkable water for all. Though Krishna's actions were seen as tyrannical, they transformed India into a utopia, making it akin to heaven on earth. And then, out of nowhere, Perun launched an attack on Krishna, who stood ready to defend himself. However, Dr. Simon Redin found himself losing track of the story. He suspected it might have been due to an overdose of antifungal pills, coupled with marijuana, as he conversed with Tom. Alternatively, it could have been simply fear clouding his mind. He mistakenly recalled a battle between Jerry Craven and Matraya, although such a fight never occurred. Then suddenly, he remembered. Back when most of his science colleagues were still alive, Dr. Simon Redding came up with the crazy idea of using Morrigan Lugos to communicate with Krishna. Since Krishna doesn't regard human life and has no reason to communicate with humans as they are not of his caliber, perhaps Krishna might listen and talk to Morrigan Lugos who is of the same status. The head of his science team thought he was out of his mind and suggested he sees a mental health practitioner. Since Morrigan Lugos had been created, Morrigan Lugos had never been allowed to step outside of their underground bunker due to a potential dangers it might pose. But Dr. Simon Redding was adamant about his idea and made the case that the egotistical Americans were sending Jerry Craven from his underground sanatorium. The Chinese are sending Matreya. The arrogant Russians have Perun en route to India. Malak is also on his way there and you can be sure the Jal has been let out. The stubborn Venezuelans also have a superhuman program, yet none are ready to negotiate with Krishna. A war between these superhumans would be a disaster for the world. The best course of action now was to facilitate communication between the two superhumans, Morrigan Lugos and Krishna. Perhaps the humans inside Morrigan Lugos would recall their duty. Seeing sense in the doctor's ideas, and after some consideration, the team leader permitted Morrigan Lugos to be exposed to the outside world. 
Morrigan Lugos felt pleased that she would experience the outside world. But in hindsight, this should have worried the doctor. As I mentioned earlier, the arrogant Russians wasted no time in challenging the underestimated Indians due to the problems caused by Krishna. They sent Perun to confront Krishna. As soon as Perun arrived in India, he headed straight for Krishna. Perun struck the ground, causing it to erupt towards Krishna, who was already aware of Perun's presence. Without hesitation, Krishna invoked the power of nature, creating a protective energy barrier around himself. However, Perun was determined and continued to charge forward, nullifying every defensive move made by Krishna. Despite Krishna's attempt to dodge, Perun was swift enough to land a blow, cutting Krishna's arms with his double axe. The fight between Perun and Krishna shook the world. At this time, Morgan Lugos was being lifted out of the underground bunker to the outside world under the supervision of Dr. Simon Redding and his scientific associates. This looked like the only option in saving the world by creating a communication link which allowed Moriga Lugos to communicate through a chemical stream that altered the air current as it traveled. Air traffic was shut down due to the unusual air stream racing out of the middle of the United Kingdom where Morrigan Lugos was communicating through chemical signals. The egotistical Americans who often feel the need to prove points unnecessarily became aware of the battle in India and decided to intervene by sending their superhuman Jerry Craven who was flying towards India. Seeing that Krishna was unarmed and feeling overly confident for a moment, Perun decided to finish him off. However, he was caught off guard when Krishna, utilizing the powers of nature around him, struck Perun in the chest. Shocked, Perun decided to fight back with full force, unleashing all the power he possessed. However, this proved to be a mistake on Perun's part. Without noticing what lay beneath him, Krishna created an ice pick and pierced Perun from beneath. Splitting him into two, this resulted in a massive explosion equivalent to a nuclear blast from Perun's destruction. In the end, Krishna emerged victorious. To add insult to injury, Malak was already en route to India upon witnessing the explosion from a distance, leaving destruction in his wake with every step he took. The world was aware of the havoc he wrecked in Tehran, where he created a massive crater that swallowed nearly the entire population, all because Malak possessed the ability to dissociate atomic bonds in nearby spaces by disintegrating objects into their fundamental building blocks simply by walking past them. His mere presence or proximity to objects causes them to break down into individual atoms, resulting in their complete destruction. He is a living manifestation of destruction and chaos because Malak possesses the ability to extend a field of destruction around him, which trails behind him as he moves. Wherever Malak goes, this field of destructions follows him, leaving devastation in its wake. At this time, Krishna was becoming increasingly aware and responsive to any encroachments or intrusion into his domain or territory as he sensed the oncoming Malak approaching. The truth is that Krishna could create or move materials at a rate faster than Malak's field of destruction could eliminate it. And before Malak could get close to him, Krishna counteracted Malak's destructive influence and threw him out of the planet into outer space. In a state of panic or extreme distress, Malak expands the range of his destructive influence to the maximum extent possible, utilizing his abilities to the fullest to protect himself and ensure his survival. However, he collided with the moon by mistake or by chance as he drives through it, turning half of the moon to dust. And before everyone knew what was happening, plenty of lunar chunks in different shapes and sizes began to drop on Earth with devastating consequences and people met their demise. So Dr. Simon Redding knew it was time to leave his place of employment and head towards London because of the escalating chaos and danger unfolding around him. Chunks of continents were falling into sea, chunks of the moon were falling onto Earth, and nuclear weapons were going off like popcorn. Things got worse for the humble Chinese population due to Maitreya's appearance. At that moment, despite the catastrophic events unfolding in India, such as fires and the atomizations of citizens and the threat of a nearby nuclear explosion in Pakistan, Krishna somehow managed to recombine the matter of India infrastructure. Furthermore, 
Krishna transformed this infrastructure into machinery capable of significantly improving the environment and most importantly capable of mitigating the effects of disaster and revolutionizing India's environmental conditions for the better. Everyone in Varanasi, a city near Mumbai, fled further away from the approaching Maitreya but to no avail. Maitreya proceeded to take almost all of the population and began shaping and manipulating their flesh into intricate and complex objects in a show of challenge to Krishna. Dr. Simon Redding pondered that if everyone had allowed Krishna to continue with his transformation, perhaps the world wouldn't be on the brink of destruction. However, the truth was that such an idea was unpopular at the time. The superhumans or powerful entities involved in the conflict had caused extensive environmental damage. As a result of their actions, many nations, which these creatures were supposed to safeguard, had been severely affected, either directly by their actions or through conflicts with others. The sad reality is that the situation was becoming increasingly dire and the possibility of restoring normalcy and stability was fading away. Even at the brink of destruction, another war was brewing. Krishna was in the west, Maitreya was from the east and Jerry Craven was flying from America preparing to battle with Krishna. Meanwhile, Morrigan Lugos attempted to communicate with one or more beings similar to herself through esoteric biochemical means. One thing that surprised the doctor was the respectful Japanese silence, in which they could create a powerful advanced superhuman to save us all. Essentially, Morrigan Lugos, who presumably had been communicating through chemical signals, suddenly gained the ability to produce audible speech and began receiving sounds from the epicenter of India. Morrigan Lugos's mouth somehow transformed into speakers, allowing the rare occasion of speech to be heard, which was then translated. This unexpected development prompted the installation of recording equipment to capture and study this phenomenon further. Dr. Simon Redding, recognizing the significance of this event, remotely accessed the audio streams and continued monitoring the situation using satellite imagery. You see, the elusive British were aware that Maitreya was building up its strength. They also believed that Krishna is likely unaware of Maitreya's action. Furthermore, they reasoned that Maitreya will probably make its move against Krishna before Jerry Craven is deployed. However, despite their knowledge and reasoning, they come to the realization that their understanding of the situation and their ability to predict events have become irrelevant. They acknowledge that the circumstances are beyond their control and comprehension. Krishna's new structure were beneficial for the environment as they were releasing oxygen into the air and consuming pollutants. As a result, it became evident that the remaining surviving population was being taken care of in some manner. You see, early analysis suggested that Krishna's intention was not to completely destroy the population but rather reduce it. This implies that Krishna's actions, while drastic, were not aimed at wiping out the entire population of India. Instead, they were seen as measures to address environmental issues and improve the overall well-being of the surviving populace. China has become unusually quiet, leading to the speculation that Maitreya may have been assembling Chinese citizens into his amagadon of flesh. Estimating the number of people incorporated and interpolated into Maitreya's plans of gigantic flesh is difficult as Maitreya flew towards India. This massive flesh was transformed into a giant flying human bat. Maitreya begins by destroying Krishna's newly built structures as a display of challenge while targeting some remaining Indians. However, under its command, Maitreya's flying human flesh bat unexpectedly feels Krishna's fiery retaliation. The bat blindly lands on an ice peak set as a trap by Krishna. Krishna then demonstrates his strength by summoning serpents to attack Maitreya and his beasts at the ice peak. From the mouth of each snake emerge blue like bees which swarm and attack, devouring the remaining flesh of the flying human flesh bat. As Maitreya remains unaware of the chaos unfolding around him, the blue bees turn their attention to him. With no means of defense against Krishna's powers, the bees penetrated Maitreya's body and entered his brain through his mouth, causing it to explode. It underscores Krishna's strategic prowess and ability to manipulate natural elements and creatures to his advantage. The sudden and unexpected nature of Krishna's attack catches Maitreya off guard, leading to his swift downfall. Right in Krishna's presence was a forthcoming Jerry Craven, and another battle was about to emerge. Both superhumans stare at each other 
for a while. And then the uneventful happened. Jerry Craven expresses his conflicted feelings to Krishna. He introduced himself as coming from heaven but acknowledges that he doesn't feel deserving of being there due to his flaws and mistakes. Jerry then marvels at the place Krishna had created, liking it to heaven or what heaven could be like when fully realized. Despite being taxed with killing Krishna, Jerry struggles with the idea as he sees no wrongdoing in Krishna's action. He also expresses a desire to no longer reside in heaven. Then Krishna kisses Jerry Craven as a symbolic gesture of healing and reconciliation. Out of nowhere, the Jal appeared in the presence of Jerry Craven and Krishna and expressed to both of them that all possible timelines resulting from a truce between Craven and Krishna would lead to utopian world with Dajjal deems so boring that he cannot bear to experience. Dajjal's rejection of Utopia highlights the human need for challenge, adversity and unpredictability in life even at the cost of destruction and chaos. To escape this fate of eternal boredom, Dajjal chooses to self-destruct. This decision culminates in a massive explosion that wrecks havoc across most of Asia and Europe in resulting in widespread destruction and loss of life. Tragically, both Krishna and Craven are caught in the blast and perish in the process. At this very moment, Morrigan Lugos is producing spores, reproductive cells without any restrictions or constraints. The doctor warned Tommy, who was hiding in an underground bunker in America, to make sure he gets enough antifungal medicine as Morrigan Lugos takes over the world and that, as for him, he's going to swim and meet with his god.